So we're going to go through some mailbag. This is the first one for this session. And it's from um, Rudy Adrian. And he says, yeah, but Yamaha made an adapter cartridge for the DX7 Mark II. And they did. It's called the ADP-1. So this is in response to a video I did way back when I first started this channel in 2015 about the fact that um, the, cartridge, the cartridges between a, a DX7 Mark I and a DX7 Mark II are different. In that the DX7 Mark I, the cartridges are smaller than they are a DX7 Mark II. So Yamaha did produce something called an ADP-1 cartridge. Um, which effectively you can slot the Mark I cartridges into the top of that and it will then fit into the DX7 Mark II. Which means that you can use DX7 Mark I cartridges on the DX7 Mark II, but you can't use DX7 Mark II cartridges on the DX7 Mark I. Hopefully that, that, that's coming out alright. Now, the other thing about the ADP-1 cartridge is that there are certain individuals um, who are selling this cartridge. And it is a very rare thing to get hold of. So obviously there weren't very many of them made or they've been broken over the years or disappeared into the, into the bottom of people's drawers and wardrobes, etc. So they tend to be quite expensive to acquire. Um, I did see uh, there was a, a, a chain of comments on the channel on one of the videos, and I can't remember which one it was now, where there were two individuals actually talking about building their own one and I think they've got to prototype stage now. Um, so maybe I'll chase that up at some point. But yes, there is a cartridge called the ADP-1 that allows you to use Mark 1 cartridges on the Mark 2. So this one comes from Catharsis. Hopefully I've got that right. And he writes, and it's quite a long one, so I'm gonna have to read this. Hi, greetings from Columbia. Yesterday, I bought my first synthesizer, the Yamaha DX7 Mark II FD. That's quite a synthesizer to have for your first synthesizer, especially it's, it goes on to say with E board in it. It's only, it's only two of them here in my country, but it's broken and it's kind of confused to figure out what the problem is. I hope you could tell me. Really, I need it. Thanks. I don't have nothing of grey matter, to be honest. If you have one bank of or the info for the e-card can you please um, discard bank issue i'm not quite sure what that's all about but it's obviously a, a translation issue um well i've seen several theories about what it could be one the gray matter is very unstable what could be causing that would it be a loose cable bad welding i think it means bad soldering or welding in the ic that's not uh, correct i saw a vsm uh, I saw recently a person who had exactly the same problem, but I could not know if that was the solution that solved the problem of the synthesizer. Two, bad operating system, caused by glitch, glitch patches. The guy who sold it to me said he was going to send me four cartridges, which he did not pack in the shipping company, but told me he was going to send them today. That will be the first test to see if loading sounds um, can resolve the rare characters. However, he told me that he had never uncovered it and I also think it's pertinent to change the battery. Agreed, the battery probably should be changed. Um, the guy I found in the VSM had exactly the same problem but was only posting updates about their fixes, which makes it a bit confusing to know what the problem was that caused the synthesizer. Um, it will not save presets or preferences, show rare characters such as squares, letters, and Japanese characters making strange noises that I could take off the expression card, but I really do not know. I have a friend who makes pedals and, arrange, and arranges instruments. I'll take the synthesizer to see what the problem may be. There is one card, um, there is some way to remove the e-card as the e-card replaces some component that's necessary to put back on the uh, DX7 Mark II FD stock. To be honest, I think it's only a battery, but I have to wait till Monday to a friend who makes the pedals and it's an electrical engineer. He told me to make the DX, take him to the DX7. So, I apologise for the um, the English. Obviously, uh, Colombia is not an English-speaking nation, so some of his English, some of his translations is not particularly brilliant. But hey, I think we got the gist of it. So this is in response to a video I did again about the DX7, but this was about replacing the battery and upgrading to a normal battery. Funny enough, I'm probably going to do another one of those because I've never been happy with the solution I put in there. Um, 
But what I would say is, first of all, greetings to Colombia. I'm getting to South America. So there's at least some positive there. Um, the DX7 is a very good synthesizer. It's a bit basic by today's standards, but if you know what you're doing, you'll still get a very, very good set of sounds out of that, that particular board. Um, the main issue with the DX7, um, from what I've seen uh, and friends have told me in the past, is things like aftermarket modifications. Now, aftermarket modifications have really expanded what a DX7 can do. But if they've been poorly implemented, then they can hamper what a DX7 can do. Um, quite often, what they require is you to take chips out uh, replace chips with their chips and quite often take jumper leads um, from various sockets or pins on the board to make their solution work better. Now I've never had a grey matter e-card um, and I'm not sure I'd want one um, but that's personal preference because I'd prefer to keep my DX7 pretty pristine and uh, and uh, and uh, as factory uh, modification so um, I don't have direct experience with the modification but I have seen the modification so I'm going to try and answer the queries um, in 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 that fashion generally memory serves me um, the modifications for the e-series card require you to remove two chips and replace one with a, a chip daughter board and solder a, a fly lead or two two fly lead or two to two specific legs of another chip combination. Um, if my memory is correct, that would start my investigation, make sure all those, uh, make sure the daughter board is properly seated for starters, so make sure it's actually in, in the IC socket, because as I remember it, there's like a, um, it comes with a, effectively a chip mount that actually mounts onto the circuit board that it pushes into. And the other thing I would do is definitely look over the board to see if you've got any dry joints and look for sort of signs of, of dry joints, you know, slight cracks or, or lines within the solder. If you've got that scenario going on, it's very, very possible you've got a dry joint going on there. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't be a, 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 wouldn't harm just to touch the solder to let it reflux uh, and clear the dry joint out. So. So that's the thing I would do. I would visually inspect the pins, make sure that where it's been pushed down into the IC socket where the chip has come out, there's no pins that look like they've been bent and have not actually correctly married up. Um, it's quite possible that when you've pushed the chip, the chip down in, if a pin was slightly forward, it, it's basically done that. So instead of going into the socket, it's sort of ridden up and gone over the socket and bent itself very very possible if you're not using the right tools to put chips in and out that's a very common uh, thing i've seen i've done it myself that's why i went and bought the right tools um many many years ago it really was an expensive mistake that because when i tried to pin the, bend the pin back the pin snapped on me and i ended up having to go and buy a new chip and luckily enough that piece of that chip was still stopped by a major manufacturer um so there'd be the first things i would look at um the other thing about solder is depending on who did it, where did it, and the age of the solder that they used, it is very, very possible that um, it never made a particularly good joint in the first place. And in some instances, it's probably, if you have some solder that looks very, very iffy, is actually use some braid or a solder sucker or a removal tool to take the solder off and actually re-solder the joint uh, with modern solder. Because modern solder, a is, is, is a better conductor than solder used to be, if that makes any sense. And also it doesn't have lead in it, because that's how they used to make the solder flow. Um, so that sort of kind of answers question one. Um, question two, um, in terms of the operating system, uh, one of the things about the e-card is it actually replaces the Yamaha operating system with the grey matter version of the DX7 operating system. Um, it doesn't take any of the features of the DX7 operating system away, but it adds a whole load of stuff into the operating system. 
And if they didn't do this, if they didn't replace that operating system ROM chip, which is effectively one of the chips you take out, um, with their version, all the features that gray, the, the Grey Matter card gives you wouldn't be available. It's, it's really quite that simple. Um, now, the other thing I, I understand is, and I could be wrong on this because it's, it's a long time since I've, I've played with Grey Matter. Um, now, I understand that the version 1 was from the Mark 1 and the version 2 was from the Mark 2, and I could be completely wrong about that, but that was sort of kind of what um, my understanding was. So it could be an idea just to make sure if you open it up and look at the version number of the chip, for grey matter and make sure that it is a, corresponds to a two, not a one. Um, and in terms of question three, um, in the past I've Googled E to see what the issues that, um, appear to be with the failing battery. Um, and nine times out of ten, it's nothing to do with the e-card at all. It's probably just a good idea and, and good economy, effectively, to put a new CR through. CR. 2032 into the machine itself. Um, now, with a lot of these older synthesizers, as soon as the battery starts to go, that's when they do th weird and wonderful things with characters on screen. Um, it's because effectively the internal vol the internal volatile memory that's kept alive by the battery is not getting enough power, and then it just corrupts. That's that's literally what's going on here. Um, so, putting a new battery in will probably give you the right um, voltage, the volatile memory will be retained, and that theoretically, with a little bit of luck, will um, uh, solve the problem. Now, what you did ask is whether I, once you initialize, can I help with the SysX files? Now, I do not have, if there are specific SysX files for any, a grey matter e-card, I don't have those. But if you want basic standard SysX files for a DX7, ping me on the channel, send them across to you, no, no problems whatsoever. So there you go. Um, there is a Yamaha Musicians blog site, and I have actually put the uh, blog site uh, into the uh, description below, but I will read it out. And it is Yamaha Musicians of Word dot com forward slash forum. If you go there and you type in things, there's loads of blogs there with really helpful information about. Um, Yamaha DX, especially DX, FBO1, TX81Z synthesizers. So let me know how you get on. I'll leave it at that. Okay, the next one is from First Von M. Um, that's a huge monster. It must be about two and a half meters long. Now, this is from a video I did, a Sunday morning rant I did about the Roland A80. And it is an utter monster. Um, but it's not quite two and a half metres long. It is a metre and a half long. It's just slight, you know, if I put it there, it's about there on me. Um, I'm 1.8 metres high from foot to, st foot to top. Um, I think the biggest problem with the A80, and the biggest problem I've encountered with the A80, is its weight and size and dimensions. It is by far the heaviest keyboard I've got. Um, only to be seconded, I might add, by the T1. The T1 is a heavy beast. Um, and both those keyboards, I need two people to, when I'm moving it around the studio, or I'm moving it from the studio into storage, I need two people to be able to do that because I cannot lift the A80 in its travel case into the boot of my car to go down to storage. I just physically, well, I can. That's not true. I can lift it. I just don't want to put it back out doing it. Um, gone are the days when I used to be a mobile DJ at one point. I used to think nothing about lifting, you know, speakers sort of um, up two flights of stairs. Um, I'm not that fit anymore. I'm definitely not that fit anymore. Um, so it is. It is a beastie. Um, it's in the studio. I'm using it quite a lot at the moment um, when it's not too hot to be down there because the studio is like a furnace. It's well insulated, which is great in the winter because you don't need a lot of power in there to actually, you know, to heat it. But in the summer, God, <laughs> it's roast in there. Um, yeah. And the final one from Rick Toza. 
uh, and he writes star duct tape. Uh, again, relating to the same uh, wrote SMR uh, in 2000, September 2017. Um, I don't know whether that's do I know what duct tape is or what is duct tape. Um, so it, if, it's known as all kinds of names all around the world. I mean, there was when I lived in the States in 2000 and no, sorry, not 2007, it would have been a oh god long time ago. Uh, 1997, um, there was a TV show on one of the US channels called, I think it was called Tool Time, and one of the segments was done by the duct tape guys, um, and they basically used to make all these sort of tools and accessories out of duct tape. It was quite amusing, very amusing. Um, so they, so it, it's called duct tape by certain fraternities. Over here, we used to call it gaffer tape. Um, don't know why it was ever called gaffer tape, but people over here used to call it duck gaffer tape. Um, uh, it's called gorilla tape as well. Um, but what I do know about this stuff is, a, it's incredibly sticky, which is great um, because what I used to use it for, I always used to have a roll of duct tape or gaffer tape in the in the in the bag, and I used to use it for. Um, you know, plastering the cables onto the stage so that people didn't fall over them. And now I can remember years ago, this is going back quite, well, many, many years ago, really is going back many years ago, when um, a friend of mine who was the lead guitarist of a particular group that I was um, tinkering with at the time, um, went herring across the stage trying to do sort of a Dave Lee Roth impression, uh, managed to catch his finger feet under the uh, microphone cable that was coming off his amplifier because he liked to have his amplifier up close to him um, this is before you know these are the days where you used to have everything in the boot of your car um, yeah so we used to have a microphone on the back of his on the front of his amplifier going off to the sound desk that's how the sound was projected um, and he decided he was going to do this David Lee Roth impression just sliding across the stage uh, he didn't get too far because he managed to catch his foot I think he had a pair of um, uh, the sort of the 60s style boots that blokes used to wear. I think he had a pair of them and he went caught it under this cable instead of sort of like doing the Dave Lee Roth bit on his knees, he ended up doing the Dave Lee Roth pat on his nose. So yeah, that's what we used to use duct tape for. Anyway, that's the last of this segment. Hope you keep well. See you again soon. Bye bye. Remember, hit that like button if you like what you saw. Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified about more rants, more mailbag, more questions and answers and more videos about this sort of stuff when it's loaded to the channel. Until next time, bye bye.